Hi there, I'm Tom Field. I'm Senior Vice President of Editorial with Information Security Media Group. My topic of conversation today, how to build a blueprint for secure software. Joining me to discuss this is Dan Shagru, Security Product Marketing at Digital.ai. Dan, it's always a pleasure to see you. Good to see you as well, Tom. Dan, in our previous conversation, we focused on putting the SEC in DevSecOps. Let's talk a little bit more now about the need for building security into application creation. Where do you see threat actors taking advantage of weak applications? Of course, we see it in the news all the time. Of course, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll answer in two parts. So they're they're getting the weak applications just about everywhere. Um, they're getting them at, on the App Store, on the Play Store. In some cases, especially if it's outside of the U.S., they're getting them on third-party stores like uh, Humble Bundle or the Samsung Galaxy App Store. Um, and then, you know, the second part of the answer is where are they taking advantage of them? Well. They're taking advantage of them in just about anywhere they can, you know, whether it's their mom's basement in a government lab or a sandbox, um, any place that they can run them on a decompiler uh, or a debugger um, or a jailbroken or a rooted device. Now, the devil's advocate here. Why is this a problem? Well, yeah, no, well, it's a, it's a problem because, you know, as we discussed last time, uh, the apps that, you um, companies are putting out there into the wild uh, have to, by definition, contain a working example of how to bypass the security perimeter that that same company is putting up in order to keep uh, threat actors out. Um, so, you know, you can fairly easily imagine the kind of chaos that a threat actor can create once they get their hands on, say, a, a retail uh, app, a banking app, or, you know, an airline app, which we heard about um, was relatively recently in the news um, with one of the major airlines that was hacked through a mage card attack. Um, if, an, if a threat actor can disassemble an app, um, they can potentially get the keys to the kingdom, um, which means that they can withdraw money, uh, they can access personally identifiable information, get someone's credit card, et cetera. Um, and, and I have a, I mean, I'd actually like to give an even sort of more colorful example um, that's benign, but I think illustrates just how vulnerable we are um, and, and how vulnerable we're making ourselves as applications proliferate um, and we use them to do everyday things such as making dinner. So I've, I've got a friend who's into grilling meat as many of us are, especially in these summer months. Um, he bought himself a fancy grill, it came with an app um, and the app controlled the grill, you know, um, but the app that in the version that he got, I don't know if they've changed it since then, this is just it's only a couple of months ago, it didn't support reports about the smoking session. So he's, you know, into it. He wants to be able to get a minute by minute graph of the time and the grill temperature and the meat temperature. Um, so he could figure out, you know, what the best method was. Um, and in order to do that, he needed to access the API and record the data himself because the app didn't support it. So he got, you know, any number of the disassemblers that are available for free on the internet um, with this Android app in this case, and started modifying it and once he disassembled it to print out the debug statements in order to figure out what was going on. It took him a few hours, um, but he finally got to the point where he thought he understood the API and it dawned on him, that, well, couldn't possibly be right because it, it didn't seem like the app was ever using either his username or account to access the API. Um, so he's like, you know, this can't, this can't be right, right? So just for fun, he writes a test script. Um, and sure enough, he could see his grill. Uh, he could change the desired temperature. And then he decided to try to change one string using the serial number of the grill to a wildcard character. And sure enough, he immediately had everyone's grill data scrolling across the screen. So he could see every person who had bought that grill. He could see what the temperature was of the grill, and he could also change the temperature, um, which is, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, someone who's doing it for the laughs or the lulls could be fun, right? You can just burn someone's steak. Um, he didn't do that. Um, it's, it's a relatively harmless example. But if you're talking about a slow cooker and you have someone who is less on the lawful side and more on the uh, unlawful or perhaps evil side, you can see someone not only turning up to the grill to burn a steak, but turning on a slow cooker to 500 degrees for 12 hours and potentially starting a fire. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of funny example, but it quickly becomes serious when you think about all of the different applications of 
no pun intended, that that type of uh, reverse assembly can lead to. And that's the type of thing that someone who's doing this for profit will do um, if it's a retail connected app and it has access to credit card data, um, you know, or if it's a banking, even, you know, even worse, a bank connected app, um, or again, like an airline connected app. Um, so, you know, these, this, this, this becomes, that's basically the problem is that uh, the apps can be reverse engineered and made to do things that um, can potentially cause harm uh, if the person doing them is uh, falls on that spectrum of uh, evil or chaotic. So Dan, in terms of reverse engineering, exactly how easy have we made it for the threat actors? The example you gave is it's kindergarten. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I, I'm going to use the term we loosely here because I, <laughs> I, neither of us are responsible for this, but there are tools out there um, and they're not necessarily, you know, really like any tool, a tool can be used for good or for evil. Um, Frida is one such example. It advertises itself as a dynamic instrumentation toolkit for developers. I mean, developers need to be able to reverse engineer code as well in order to figure out how it works um, or, or to uh, debug it, for example. Um, it's available for security researchers to see if they um, have some sort of vulnerability in their app. Um, and as such, it's, you know, it's available on the open web. You don't even have to go to the dark web to get it. It's, you know, it's supported by a white hat um, company uh, or basically sponsored by one. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it basically, there, there, there's a whole community of people who use it and publish their scripts and the scripts themselves allow threat actors or again, good actors to do just about anything they want with them. So that's one example. Ghidra is, an, is a deco decompiler. Um, that was initially created by the National Security Agency, um, or if you're in the US, NSA is enough to uh, identify that group. Um, and it was leaked by WikiLeaks back in 2017. In 2019, uh, NSA sort of decided, hey, you know, cat's out of the bag, we may as well just open source this and publish it on GitHub, since there are people who can use it for good. Um, but again, you know, or not, I guess I shouldn't say, but, you know, the tool is, it's just available for a white hat or a black hat alike. And it's very much a part of any developer's toolkit. Um, so, you know, uh, I guess the short answer to your question is it's very easy. There are open source versions. There are versions, you know, originally created by the NSA. There are versions that are created by white hat hackers. Um, and you don't have to even go to the dark web in order to get them. So talk to me about a protection blueprint. How can that help secure applications? Right, so, so this gets kind of into the meat and potatoes of, of what my company does for um, our customers. And that's, we provide a means to create what we call a blueprint, um, you can call it a guard spec that uh, protects applications in, in two fundamental ways. So, so first of all, it obfuscates the code itself so that when it is reverse engineered, it's virtually unreadable to a threat actor. Um, and then second of all, um, it protects against tampering, uh, such as reverse engineering, by alerting the company or the people um, in its um, security operations center when the code has been modified. Or even if it's been put in one of the emulators, the decompilers, or the um, dynamic instrumentation toolkits that I mentioned earlier, um, it's, it basically, you know, it alerts the person in the socks so that they can take some sort of action. Dan, what does disassembled machine code actually look like to a threat actor? Okay, cool. So I, I'm actually glad that you asked that question. And let me share my screen just for one second to show. It's a little bit tough to show in one slide, but there, there's actually, well, so let me, you know, as simply as I can put it, on the left here, we have the unobfuscated machine code disassembled. And, and the big difference here between the unobfuscated code and the obfuscated code is just that the uh, threat actor can read um, an if-then loop um, or a for loop. And essentially from that, like especially if we're talking about uh, like a password check, for example, in, in the most um, sort of simple example, they can see where the password is being checked and then look up um, the machine code to find the opposite of what's being checked. In other words, instead of like saying no on an incorrect password, it says yes. And we have a, a, a pretty, uh, or a longer explanation of how this works, um, both from the threat actor's perspective and from the company that's protecting the codes at perspective in a webinar that we call how to build a blueprint uh, for secure software, which I recommend everybody check out. Um, but the long and short of it, I, I think I can, 
basically described here, instead of the if and then loops, you base the threat actor basically just sees a big block of code that becomes very arduous to um, understand if there's no clues uh, in that code, meaning, you know, there's no text strings, uh, meaning that the, there's no blocks built in, they can't see where the loops are, they can't see where the checks are, uh, et cetera. So that's kind of the shorter answer to your question. So a couple of related questions here for you, Dan. One yeah. is, how is digital AI helping customers not just protect, but to monitor? Oh, right. So, yeah. So, the, and I mentioned this earlier. So um, I mentioned, you know, two fundamental ways. One is the obfuscation. That's what we're, what we're basically looking at here. The other is what happens when a threat actor tries to, first of all, disassemble the code, and then second of all, actually change it. Um, and the way that we do that is through a monitoring tool um, that is can be run standalone, um, but most of our customers prefer to integrate it with their existing uh, SIM or you know, business intelligence tool in their SOC. Um, and what that essentially looks like is something like this. So uh, when something, in this case, we're looking at an alert for uh, someone trying to tamper with JavaScript. So we'd see the guard name in this case is script verification, um, just descriptive, you know, uh, that's also the type of the event. And we're seeing here, in this case, the IP address of the threat actor who's trying to or is in the process of tampering with the JavaScript. We're seeing their location. Um, in, this, in this case, it's um, Tao Yuan City in Taiwan. The operating system on which they are uh, running um, and trying to uh, tamper with the code, um, the time uh, that they tried to tamper, and then the time of detection. Usually, that's going to be the same time. Uh, Although if they take the script offline, you know, it could be two separate times and that might be important to the person looking into it. Um, you get the UAE so that your, you know, uh, universal application interface so that you know exactly uh, well, what type of device they're working on, the browser they're working in, user agent, et cetera, uh, URL. So, I mean, the URL obviously is very important because that tells you, okay, which part of our script is being tampered with. Um, so this is, yeah, this is uh, one of the screens within the, um, the monitoring tool that we provide for our customers. Dan, take it a step further. How yeah. do you help your customers not just protect, not just monitor, but react as well? Right. No, and this is, uh, I'm very glad that you asked this question as well. So, you know, it's, it's not enough to just see that this is happening. You have to be able to actually do something about it. And, and you have to be able to do something, you know, in real time, especially given that there's, you know, 7 million uh, job openings for security practitioners and only about 4 million people that are that have some sort of certification in security. So basically, you need the, the ability to re respond automatically. And that's what that's what runtime application self protection is or RASP. Um, we provide that the various things that can be programmed into uh, one's code, or our customers code are, you know, first of all, um, they can um, alter the uh, features of the application, right? So they can just say, I mean, let's say it's uh, um, well, one of the more fun examples would be uh, like a gaming app. Um, you can get the gaming app to uh, change the gravity setting to zero so that if someone tries to cheat, the players just float off the field. Um, and that can be very frustrating for the uh, attacker. If it's a banking app, you can force step up authentication um, or you can force you know, knowledge-based authentication, whatever, whatever type of like extra authentication steps you wanna take. Um, or you know, if it's a banking app uh, for like a, a high net worth individual, you can just simply shut down the app, you know, erase any type of uh, risk whatsoever by not allowing any access at all. Um, so that's how we do that. Dan, been a terrific overview so far. Where can our audience go to get greater depth on this topic? Yeah, um, would love to see um, any of you at digital.ai slash application dash security. Um, from there, you can do, use the contact us. Uh, you can email me directly, Daniel Chagru at digital. Sorry, Daniel dot Chagru at digital.ai. Um, and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to hearing from people and spreading the word and uh, hopefully making the applications that are coming out with greater regularity safer um, and making the world safer for digital commerce and life. Excellent. Dan, always appreciate talking with you. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it as well. Again, Thank the topic has been how to build a blueprint for secure software. You just heard from Dan Shagru, his security product marketing at digital.ai. 
For Information Security Media Group, I'm Tom Field. Thank you for giving us your time and attention for this session today.